Welcome to Beat Diabetes, and in today's program, I want to share with you the means and ways to get to where you want to go in the fastest possible way. There are a lot of folks that will tell you, here's how you can beat diabetes, Here how you, here's how you can improve yourself, improve your situation, lower your A1C, and uh, they, they have different ideas about it. Some say that if you'll just exercise, and if you'll just start jogging, you'll do the job. You will beat diabetes. Others say, well, no, what you really need to do is cut out all the animal products. Just give up meat entirely and boom, like magic, diabetes will go away. Now, I'll say this. There are a lot of different means and ways and ideas that can help get you go in the right direction. If you give up sugar and that's all you do, you're going to improve some. Or if you say, well, I'm going to start jogging, you will improve some. If you've not jogged at all, not exercised at all, and now you're exercising under the counsel and guidance of a physician, uh, that can help. But the real issue is not, I want to do something that can help me. The real issue is, I want to get to the land of non-diabetes, A1C below 6.5, fasting glucose around 100 or maybe better. 95, whatever. I want to get there as fast as I possibly and reasonably can. Now, I'm not suggesting some kind of a, a crash course that's going to harm you because you can do things too fast. But I don't want to dilly-dally around either. Let's suppose I lived in northernmost Canada. I don't know what city that would be, but just about as far north as you can go and still be in Canada. And I said, you know what? I want to set a record I want to be in the Guinness Book of, of World Records. I'm going to crawl down to the very southern tip of Chile, or Chile, or Ch <laughs> we call it different names. I'm going to go to the southern tip of Chile, about as far south in South America as you can go. Now, here I am in northern Canada, and I'm going to crawl there. Well, guess what? I'd never make it. At, at my age, I would never make it. I would die before I ever got there. But when I start crawling to... Chile, uh, I'm, I'm going the right direction. I am making some progress. Let's say I crawled an entire mile the very first day, and I am now one mile closer to my goal to the southernmost part of South America than I was when I started. I've made progress. If, if a reporter comes to me and puts a mic in my face and say, well, how'd you do? I can say, truthfully, I've made progress. But it's not enough progress. It is absolutely not the way for me to get to the southernmost part of South America. On the other hand, I could get in a plane and be there in a few hours. So we want to get there as quick as we reasonably can. We don't want to push it so fanatically that we harm ourselves. So there is such a thing as doing it in a gradual sense, but kind of a speedy gradual sense. So the answer is not just cut down on sugar. That's a good start. Do some exercise. It's a good thing, but that will not be the speediest way. The speediest way is what I'm going to show you today. Now, this is actually part two. We started last week. If you missed that episode, you need to catch up and, and watch that. But I went to the grocery store, went to Walmart the other day last week and snapped a whole bunch of pictures. And I was hoping nobody would try to stop me and they didn't. So thanks, Walmart, for that. And I just talk about some foods, what's good, what's not good. Now, on last week's program, we talked about meat, and meat is such a huge part of beating diabetes. I know some of you are vegetarians, and I'm not going to try to persuade you to change your mind. I'm just saying, if you don't have some kind of an ethical or a religious reason to be a vegetarian, if you just think you're doing it for your health, don't. <laughs> now, I respect you. If it's part of your religion, you say, I want to follow my religion. Okay, I get that. Or if you say, I just can't stand cruelty to animals, uh, so I can never eat a, a dead animal, can never eat a steak or a chicken. Well, okay, uh, that's not how I feel. But if that's your uh, opinion, if that's your conviction, then I'll respect that. It's going to be harder, though. I mean, this, the simplest, fastest way is to incorporate meat into your diet and uh, low-carb vegetables, 
and uh, certain other foods. So speaking of foods, here we go. We're going to go back to Walmart once again. Actually, a bunch of pictures I took at Walmart while I stand in my studio behind a green screen or in front of a green screen, rather, and talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. A lot of times we want some jelly on some kind of a food product. Usually it's put on bread and toast, which you shouldn't be eating anyway. But uh, if you're going to get jelly, they do make some sugar-free jellies, but you've got to be careful because some of them still have quite a few carbs. I think most of the sugar-free jellies are going to be about five grams per one tablespoon. I think it's one, maybe two. And uh, you, you put several tablespoons on, you're up to 15 20 grams of carbs. So you got to watch it, even the sugar-free. But definitely, if you have to have jelly, go for the sugar-free over the regular sugar-filled jelly. Peanut butter is great. Uh, it is not going to spike your blood sugar much at all. Now, the typical standard peanut butter that you buy, the name brands like Jif and Skippy and different ones, uh, they're going to have more sugar than would be ideal. They do add sugar to them. But still, uh, they don't spike blood sugar much. One of the reasons is they are low on the glycemic scale. They just <laughs> dissolve very, very slowly in your stomach. And uh, for the average person to have like a piece of celery with some, even the regular kind of peanut butter on it, uh, probably won't spike your blood sugar much at all. The natural peanut butters are a bit better and they don't have that added sugar. So they're better still, but I'll have to admit the, the name brand peanut butters that are not natural and have a little sugar added uh, do taste better. Well, in your frozen section, you can find things like frozen cauliflower, frozen broccoli, frozen green beans, various low carb vegetables. So these will work definitely. And uh, all you have to do is test yourself. You'll see that they work. And especially the cauliflower can be turned into a lot of different things. They make cauliflower rice these days and cauliflower <laughs> a vegetable mix that's sort of like rice plus veggies, but it's, there's no rice to it. So cauliflower is a friend. Some people just don't like it. I don't mind it, especially if you're putting some kind of a sauce over it or some kind of a meat dish over the top of it. So that's something to consider for sure. Or you can just make cauliflower rice. You can buy a big head of cauliflower and you can scrape it and, and cook it up and make your own cauliflower rice. There are recipes on YouTube. Just go to the YouTube search engine and type in how to make cauliflower rice and you'll find out how to do it. Now, I already mentioned that bread and grains are problematic, and that's putting it mildly. They're just a nightmare for diabetics, pre-diabetics, and others. So you, you want to avoid bread as much as you possibly can. But when you go into the store, at least in America, I can't speak for all the nations, but in America, when you go into most grocery stores, you find the words keto on certain loaves of bread, even buns have the word keto on them. And the way they typically make these keto breads and buns is to create a super, uh, a super high fiber. They jam and cram stuff together to such a degree that the idea is it's supposed to pass right through your system without affecting your blood sugar. And so you can get keto breads that say zero net carbs or one net carb per slice or two net grams of carbs. And uh, again, they're supposed to just pass right through, no problems, no blood sugar rise. That's the theory. But I have heard again and again from many people that the theory doesn't always work out in practice. Sometimes, and especially if you have problems with delayed stomach emptying and, the, and that stuff stays in your stomach or your intestines too long, your body will break it down and then boom, here it comes. So not all that glitters is gold. Not all that says keto is necessarily good. My essential rule is this. I figure I can have, and, and uh, my blood sugar meter confirms this, one piece of keto bread. If I, want, if I feel like a sandwich or a breakfast sandwich and I have one slice of keto bread on the bottom and then put some meat, some cheese, maybe an egg on top and nothing on the top, that will work for me. 
Or if I make pizza and I take one low carb tortilla and put everything on it, that works. But I try never, never to have two pieces. Or for example, there are keto cereals. Now the cereal aisle is not your friend. I mean, it is a nightmare for diabetics. It's just, it is grain products and then they're loaded with sugar, most of them. And then you've even got those that call themselves granola cereals that make you feel like you're like John Denver with sunshine on your shoulders or climbing in the Rocky Mountains. But if you look at the carbs, they're ridiculously high. For example, with this particular granola cereal, it gives you the nutrition info for half of a cup of cereal, and it's still high. But nobody would eat a half cup of cereal. It's just it, nobody would do it. You just couldn't do it. Now, I eat cereal in small amounts, even keto cereals, and there are keto cereals. I don't trust them completely, but some of them can work for me if I will just limit myself and be under control and just have a small amount and then maybe add some sliced almonds to it, maybe a little bit of unsweetened coconut to it, maybe a few pecans to it, and I can, I can do very well with that. But even with the keto cereals, I'm not going to have a full bowl of that. I don't trust it. I just don't trust it. And especially if someone says, well, I want a dinner, but it's going to take me two good bowls of cereal, keto cereal, mind you, uh, to fill up. Uh, it wouldn't be worth it. And again, anytime you see the word keto, be a little bit cynical, a little bit suspicious, but recognize you may be able to get by with it in small portions. Now, bagels are the ab one of the absolute worst bread products you can buy. They're just jammed and crammed with bread, and they're much thicker and heavier than a piece of sliced bread. And so you can have bagels that can run up to 50, 60 grams of carbs just with that bread alone. Not that somebody's dumping a lot of sugar in them, but that bread contains the power of sugar once it goes into your body. So by all means, leave bagels alone. I don't know of any low-carb bagels. I'm sure you could buy them online, but I don't see them in the stores. So just leave bagels alone. Now here's a friend, mustard. Mustard, unless it's been sweetened, has zero carbs, none, zilch, nada. You can put as much mustard on some kind of food as you want. Ketchup, that's a different story. It's not your friend. It's loaded with sugar, but mustard has no, no sugar. So you want to... Put it on a hamburger, you want to put it on a hot dog. Uh, that mustard is not going to add any sugar to it. There are various meat sauces, steak sauces, barbecue sauces that are sugar-free, and some of them bring the carbs way down. And I, I use them myself, some of them. So uh, if you're making a nice steak and you feel like a little barbecue sauce on it or steak sauce, make sure it's sugar-free. Do not get the regular stuff. It is going to have too much sugar for you. Now here's another product we use in Benedictus okra soup, okra spinach and chicken soup. It's the Hunt's tomato sauce. Now, this particular style of Hunt's tomato sauce, and there are many different ones, but it has very low carbs to it. How do I know that? Because I've checked the cans and looked at one after another after another, and I found this and my eyes lit up. I was, I was like, this is perfect. Benedicta likes to get some tomato flavoring in her chicken okra soup. And so this is very low carb and works out well and does not, the, the soup itself does not spike my blood sugar. In fact, I've tested it many times, mostly because I'm just kind of amazed that I can enjoy a food this much as Benedicta's soup and fufu special low-carb foo-foo we make, and uh, just doesn't touch my blood sugar hardly at all. You look at the canned vegetables, some of those canned vegetables are not going to be your friends. Corn, you don't want. Uh, peas are a fairly high vegetable. Green beans work. Green beans are kind of like the king of the canned vegetables, uh, or the frozen vegetables, or the fresh vegetables, however you want to get your green beans. The green beans are going to be so superior to various other vegetables. The pasta section is normally a section you should avoid. Now, pasta has a kind of a, a unique property about it. It does not dissolve quickly in your stomach. Therefore, your spike will be delayed. If you test yourself after an hour of eating a spaghetti dinner, a lasagna dinner, you may not see much of a spike and you may say, aha, I have found the perfect high carb meal. It doesn't even spike me. 
But be careful. Sometimes if you test after two and a half to three hours after your meal, you'll find the spikes there all right. It just delayed itself. It bided its time because it takes a while for pasta to, to dissolve in your stomach. Now, macaroni and cheese is another high-carb pasta food. Americans love macaroni and cheese. It's easy to make. It's so simple. And it tastes good. Uh, I'll have to admit, it tastes good. But it is not for the diabetic, not for the pre-diabetic, not for anybody that wants to maintain good health. And essentially, all you're getting is calories and good taste. It, there's no nutrition to macaroni and cheese. What are you going to get? It's white flour. And yeah, the cheese might have some, but uh, all in all, uh, mac and cheese is not a good dish. And speaking of uh, not a good dish, how about this? Ramen soups are so popular all over the world. I think you can find them almost everywhere, every nation practically. They're simple to make. They taste good. They're cheap to produce. You can, in America, you can buy uh, a lunch worth of ramen soup for about a quarter or something like that and add a little side dish and boom, you've got your lunch. But they're just all carbs and you're just gonna have to give them up. There was a guy uh, that I used to work with. He had ramen soup every single lunch. Uh, not a good thing. At the time, I didn't know any better either. I didn't like it that much, but uh, he sure did. In most stores, you can find a section just loaded with tortillas of different brands and different sizes and different <laughs> uh, flavors sometimes. Why so many tortillas? Because we love our tortillas here in America and there's so much you can do with them. You can make uh, a breakfast burrito out of them. You can have tacos. You, you, you can do so many things with tortillas, but they are not your friend in the normal situation. Now, when I began to see they made low carb tortillas, I just was thrilled because I like my tortillas and I like to make tacos with them and other things. But I found that they can be sneaky. They can have that delayed effect sometimes three and four hours after you eat. Now, I have found that certain tortilla brands, low-carb tortilla brands, work better than others. So uh, this one that I'm showing you right now uh, is the one that I use normally. It's my go-to, and I just haven't had any problem with it. But uh, a lot of people have complained about the carb balance tortillas and said that they will really spike blood sugar. I, I can't say I've tested it myself. I'm just reporting what some have said to me. But I found something that works for me and I stick with it. But once again, it's like a one, one food item rule when it comes to store-bought keto low-carb products. I'll eat one. I'll not eat two. I'll not eat three. I will eat one. If I'm still hungry... I'll munch on some cheese or some other uh, keto product that's more natural. Now, here's a surprise. Here are some taco shells made by the company called La Tierra that actually are relatively low carb. Even though they don't say low carb on the package, they don't call themselves keto taco shells. But if you figure out how many carbs are in each taco shell, it's something like three and a half grams of carbs for each shell. So if you have three sh taco shells, and they're, they are small, but if you have three of them for a dinner, and then you stuff them with hamburger and cheese and lettuce and maybe a few pieces of tomato and a little taco sauce, you've got almost a meal. Throw in an avocado with that, you do have a meal, and they're not going to spike your blood sugar too much. Uh, they, I, I have them once in a while, even though technically they're a carb food, but they make them so paper thin. <laughs> they just don't do much. The rice section, well, you just need to stay away from it. Rice is going to spike your blood sugar terribly. There's no getting around it. I know people are desperate to be able to eat rice and they'll cook it and then they'll put it in the refrigerator and then they'll bring it out and they'll think they've helped or they'll eat their salad first and then their rice. And yeah, those things could help some. I don't know. But uh, for me, I just got a divorce from rice a long time ago. And uh, I mean, if I was at somebody's house and they offer me a rice dish, I might eat a little bit just not to offend them, but it wouldn't be much. I would go very light on the rice and much bigger on whatever sauce was going to go over the rice. Rice is not your friend. Now, here is a food that I really want to love because beans seem natural. They don't see, seem so high carby as things like rice and potatoes. 
And in fact, they're not. Uh, they are going to provide a slower, gentler rise, but they can still give you a pretty good rise if you eat too many of them. And uh, I found I can get away with eating a, a relatively smaller, not tiny, but a uh, maybe a medium to slightly below medium bowl of beans as long as it's not full of beans. And I put some other vegetables in there, maybe some celery and maybe a few slices of carrot and uh, some other vegetables. And uh, it's just not chalked filled with beans. I really do feel like beans probably could be a good food for us. And had we not gone into the land of diabetes by eating so much junk, we could probably get by eating beans all of our life without a problem. But once you cross over that border into diabetes, even beans you have to be careful with. But like I said, they may work in limited amounts. Now, if you choose to have some beans, the one thing you want to do is find the beans with the most fiber. Uh, I've gone through bean aisles, much bigger than this one, and uh, just looked at the back of the package to see how much fiber do they have. And it's kind of strange. Some uh, types of beans will have lots of fiber in uh, under one brand and under another, they won't have much. But one thing has been pretty consistent. The, the small red beans have more fiber than most all the others. So if you're going to have beans and you want to try a bean soup, go for the small red beans with all that fiber. They're not going to affect blood sugar nearly as much as some of the other beans that are going to get down into your stomach and dissolve in a hurry.